Um, just a couple of questions that I had myself, uh, maybe the witnesses uh, might answer. But first of all, at the outset, I want to say to Ms Feely, the Commission uh, and all of the, the staff that supported the, the Commission work, I think it is a very substantial body of evidence that has been produced. I think regardless of what decision is taken down the road, uh, this is very significant, very useful. It sets out very clearly the challenges and issues and the options there. And I think starts that conversation that is needed in this country in how do we address this challenge into the future. And I think a lot of the tools are here. I know members have raised questions regarding the, the figures and the modelling behind that. But I think I just want to, to publicly acknowledge that because I think it is a significant uh, piece of work and I want to commend everyone that has been involved uh, in relation to that. Just maybe um, there are a number of brief questions that I have. The, the first one is for, for you, Ms Feely, uh, and that is um, in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, you mentioned the issue of, of Class K uh, stamps um, where they would be paid uh, for uh, additional income earned. They would be paid by people beyond the, the age of 65. Uh, now, my question is, there's also uh, within the Commission report an acknowledgement that maybe some people past the age of 65 or 66, at the moment they can no longer pay PRSI contributions, that they would continue to be able to make those contributions to build up uh, an entitlement. Um, and how, how, how do you square that circle in terms of the two types of contributions beyond your 66th birthday. Some people will pay Class K, some people will, will pay maybe Class S or other uh, stamps beyond their 66th birthday. And should it not be the case that, you know, if you pay a PRSI, you should be making a contribution towards your pension up to that, whatever the threshold is, 30, 40 or, or, or 45. Uh, people continue to pay, pay beyond that. If, the uh, Commission report is implemented, but why the need for, for paying some stamps that there isn't actually an entitlement built into them uh, and should we not streamline uh, that? That's the question that I have for you. Uh, Ms Burke, in relation to and following up from your last comment regarding the issue of modelling uh, and the issue of immigration, can I come back to the other issue? And the SRI weren't able to answer this question for us last week. And that is in relation to the issue of childcare uh, and the uh, working population, the indigenous, let's say, uh, working population. And if we look at what's happening here at the moment in terms of childcare, uh, which is a replication of problems that we've seen right across Europe or over previous <coughs> generations, that the cost of, of rearing a family and particularly the cost of childcare has a double-edged uh, impact. One, uh, it reduces the fertility rate uh, in a country and is part of the contributing factor uh, to that. The other is that it reduces participation of the workforce uh, and, and PRSI contributions and taxation uh, as well. Uh, and that it has a double-edged, both short-term impact, but also a longer-term impact. And my question is, in terms of, of the work that you've done, would, what would be the benefit of, of actively supporting childcare, actively supporting greater participation of women in the workforce? What would that impact be on the long-term prognosis in relation to the cost uh, of pensions? Now, you may or may not be able to provide uh, some information today. If not, you might try and come back to us uh, and grapple with this particular challenge because it was one that the, the ESRI couldn't uh, answer for us here uh, last week. And just finally, if I could turn to, to Mr Duggan. Um, and you uh, reference in your evidence uh, the modelling costs, uh, projected costs of the pension and the actual costs of the pension. I think the projection uh, was that in 2021, um, not increasing the age from 66 to 67 would cost 221 million, 
you're now projecting that that will be 275 million uh, by uh, year end and half a, over half a billion in a full year. Can I ask you, what's the job seekers' benefit impact of that? Because if people retire at uh, 66 but can't claim their um, state pension until 67, they would have an entitlement to job seekers' benefit, um, which to me would negate a lot of the potential savings uh, that are there. Um, and can you give us the, uh, the cost, projected cost of the job seekers benefit uh, if you increase the age from 66 to 67? The other uh, question that I have is, uh, it just sounds strange to me that the projections are actually going up. When, if you look at the CSO analysis of, of the data from RIP.ie, which shows I think that there are 2,300 additional deaths as a direct result of, of COVID, or the, um, the, it indicates anyway that, that there are a direct result uh, of COVID. So the number of people, and disproportionately, sadly, we have a lot of older people who have died as a result of COVID. So the, because of COVID, we have less people claiming a state uh, pension. And yet, your projections are 54 million euro uh, out uh, in relation to, to where it would be. Uh, so, how has that, that happened when there are less people sadly claiming it because of the result of COVID? And yes, the, the cost projections are, are gone up uh, by nearly close to a quarter. Uh, it seems to be a significant uh, error in relation to those particular calculations by the department. Just the um, next question that I have then is in relation to the famous Telecom Airden shares that were lodged in the National Pension Reserve uh, Fund. Now, we all know the National Pension Reserve Fund has been raided um, for bailing out at the banks uh, and has also been used now to invest in stimulating the economy. But there will be a, a return from those investments at some stage. Um, the Minister for Finance is telling us that the uh, investments that were put into the banks are turning into a, a profit. Um, and the reality is the uh, NTMA will get a return on the investments that are now being put into indigenous businesses and so forth. So has that been modelled into to this? And could I ask... Has any consideration been given to the fact that IFAC, the, um, uh, finance, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, uh, stated that the windfalls that we're gaining at the moment in terms of corporate tax should not be put into day-to-day -day spending? And is there merit in ring-fencing some of that uh, corporate tax windfall and putting it into something like the NTPF, which was there to, to plan for uh, the cliff edge uh, down uh, the road uh, in terms of, of, of costs. If you could maybe just um, answer some of those specific questions, I'd appreciate it. Ms. start with you, Ms. Feely. So the question for me related to PRSI and Class K, I mean, by way of general remark, this is not the Commission's business, PRSI needs streamlining, so that's a different <coughs> question. The solution, the range of solutions in the our recommendations in the in the Commission's report around PRSI and older people would bring a bit of complexity. No, you're you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we're recommending that those who wish to keep contributing would pay a full contribution up to age 70 if they wanted to increase their pension. We're also recommending if they hadn't enough contributions, they would keep paying. And then they would stop when they had enough. So, and that's a recommendation. So it would involve another subclass A, where A is already broken down into people from below 300 and whatever. You know what I mean? There's, there's A 
there's subdivisions in A, there'd be a new subdivision in A. The separate recommendation is about funding. It's simply a solidarity contribution. K is the most convenient box to put that into because it exists already as a solidarity contribution in the PRSI system. So you're correct, we would be introducing some complexity. The alternative is to say everybody should continue, you know, is to simplify everything into a single, into a single rate. It's not unusual in the history of PRSI, going back to 1979, for there to be these complexities. In fact, preparing as part of the Commission's work, I discovered Class P, which I'd never heard of, which has all of about seven people in it. So it's not unusual within the PRSI system for it to provide subclasses to address particular issues. And so we were, we said the complexity is already there. Yeah, we might add a little bit to it, but not an enormous amount. If, if we could use it to particularly the flexible options for people to continue paying in order to enhance their pension or in order to <coughs> fill out their record, we thought that it was worth the complexity. Uh, and the Class K piece, as I say, is, um, is a straightforward funding, hypothecated tax almost. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just uh, Roma's going to yeah. talk about the modelling in a moment, but there are sections in the report about labour market interventions. Now, uh, uh, childcare isn't one of them, but some of the other labour market interventions are, are set out there, including government policy in relation to the labour market generally. So we were mindful of it, um, and I'll just let Roma answer whether we were able to capture childcare. Thank you. So I suppose it, 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 childcare is, is, is the trigger for helping more women participate in the workforce. So that's really what you're asking. Did the Commission consider the impact of women being uh, better facilitated to either return to the workforce or work more? And yes, that was absolutely considered very carefully at, at our technical subcommittee level. Um, I'm a lay person in terms of economics, but I was sitting beside two uh, very um, able uh, economists and we had a discussion about participation rates within the workforce um, and how that increases and the role of, of women within that. And one of the conclusions coming out of the committee is that already built into the calculations is a fairly, it's, it's not an optimistic calculation, but it's at the higher end of a range of assumptions. And basically what, what's built into the calculations is an increase in the labour force participation rate from 62 to about 66 percent. So having, uh, looking at the research, discussing it with my colleagues, we felt that there was probably limited scope for further participation, given that was a fairly uh, challenging increase in terms of labour force participation. And that in turn, obviously, um, is dependent on childcare and other factors to, to help people. But we also looked at increasing education and the impact that that has on, on people uh, going into the workforce and staying there. So there was a couple of elements to, to, to that consideration. Um, and, and my question is, and I think you've partially answered it for me, that is to put numbers on, on those. Now, as I say, I'm not expecting you to be able to provide numbers today, but I think it would be useful from a broader policy perspective in terms of the role of this committee and the recommendations this committee makes to government uh, if, if we could have figures in relation to the education and the childcare or the, the different elements uh, of increasing uh, participation within the workforce because this is childcare sadly is seen as a cost rather than the long term financial benefit that there is there for the economy in relation to it. And I think that that's important, that that's part of the overall narrative and discussion. Uh, and Mr. Duggan, you might come back. Just one other question you might answer for me when you come back. And that is, uh, is it feasible and practical in terms of the existing social welfare software system to actually pay uh, state contributory pensions uh, on the incremental quarter basis as it is being proposed by the Commission? Um, because that seems to be uh, an issue that having that quarterly incremental payment could be uh, challenging purely from the, the software system that's currently operating within the department. 
Uh, okay, Chairman. So I'll take that last question first, if I can. Um, obviously, to implement uh, the pension age increase on a quarterly basis would require system changes, but it is doable. Uh, and uh, and we have quite a bit of time to get it implemented if the recommendation from the Commission was accepted by government and implemented. So I don't think it would be a showstopper, let me put it that way. Um, the other questions you asked me about uh, the uh, benefit payment for 65 year olds, I don't have the figures to hand, but uh, the the, the expenditure on that in a year is in the region of 35 to 40 million. And uh, based on the numbers that seem to be qualifying for it or applying for it at this juncture. Um, in terms of the 221 million likely going to 275, and remember the 275 is a projection rather than an, an, an actual figure. Um, I suppose, you know, there is, it, it is impossible to be definitive about projections. Uh, the, the best we can do is estimate based on previous understandings and likely behaviours. And when projecting, the department almost always uh, errs on the side of a conservative uh, estimate uh, because it does not want to um, overstate the nature of problems. Um, consequently, uh, even though there have been tragically deaths from COVID, it is still the case that people are living much longer, healthier lives. And that dynamic that's changing quite rapidly actually and has done over the last 10 years, coupled with some budget increases like the living alone allowance and things of that nature, does mean that our projections may have been a little out uh, and a little conservative and consequently the actual costs that are being realised are a bit higher than we would have expected. But it's because it is incredibly difficult to predict uh, what the numbers will actually be over the full year and at the time we made the projection we did not know of some of those budgetary increases uh, and I think that explains the difference. Is, is, uh, just to clarify that, so what you're saying is that the uh, and look, it's impossible to be accurate. I accept that, but um, it's also the case, and EU fiscal policy forces departments to take a conservative uh, view in the other direction that they overestimate rather than underestimate uh, because uh, of the way the estimates process now works. So it doesn't stack up that the Department of Social Protection. Uh, under uh, estimated from a conservative point of view because that would be an irresponsible approach in terms of, of fiscal management because until the uh, flexibility was brought in in relation to, to EU fiscal po policy you wouldn't be able to get a supplementary estimate. Um, so that doesn't wash but are you saying to, to me that the, the main reason for the significant difference is the additional budgetary changes that have taken place in relation to entitlements. If that's the case, because the budget, the actual cost of the state contributory pension hadn't increased, that you're including in this the other additional costs, such as fuel allowance uh, and, and other supplementary benefits. Is that where this figure is coming from? No, well, first of all, I don't accept that we underestimate. Uh, we estimate. Uh, what we try to do is not overstate those estimates. Uh, and, and that's what I mean by conservative. I do not mean we underestimate, because as you say, that would be irresponsible. So we don't. The, uh, and we certainly deliberately don't. The, um, and I'm not saying that it's uh, uh, an inclusion of things like fuel allowance. I'm only including those allowances that are um, increases on the state pension payment. So somebody who's living alone gets an increase on their payment. We call it the living alone allowance, but it is effectively an increase on their payment. And it's only those that I would be including. I would not be including um, uh, fuel allowance or uh, HHB or payments of that nature. 
Uh, and it's a combination of, of, of things, Chairman. It's a combination of the fact that there are more people drawing the state pension than we may have thought because of the longevity issue that there is. Uh, thank you. And I know Deputy Coran wants to come in, uh, I'm sure. Deputy O'Cahasi would remind me that uh, in terms of the living alone allowance, I think it was the carbon tax that funded that. And it's not coming out of uh, the uh, vote from the Department of Social Protection directly. It's, it's income that has been generated by people paying carbon taxes across the country. Uh,